Okay, I think we're up and running. So hello, and um, thank you to Different Strokes and Austin for asking us to do this little talk on communication issues after a stroke. Uh, my name is Carol Pound. Um, I trained as a speech and language therapist about 200 years ago and worked for many years with people with aphasia um, in the health service, but mainly in the third sector, uh, particularly an organization called Connect Communication Disability Network. Um, more recently, I've been working as a healthcare researcher and my big interests really throughout my career have been uh, how to support people who live with aphasia. So that's the people who've had strokes and their friends and relatives to reconnect with life and uh, yeah, get on with life in the context of the challenges of some of the communication disabilities. And with me today, I have an expert on aphasia, uh, who is Basha. So do you want to say a bit about yourself, Basha? Yeah, well, I'm, I'm, um veteran for aphasia because I had my stroke um, 20 years ago and um, you know my 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 career after that is um, going to drop in um, therapy um, peer support uh, people um, doing a bit of um, well a few training um for for professional who are in the well professional like um nurses doctors whatever and research as well some some people in connect the charity no longer exists and some people some other people university i do research with them as well so I'm a lot of experience, but very yeah, experienced, I, yes, yeah. and a superstar. Okay, so how we're going to do this is I'm going to talk through um, uh, some of the issues that occur after a stroke in relation to communication disability, and then at the end uh, we've got a few questions that Bash is going to help me um, answer, hopefully. So I'm going to share my screen now so that you can see what we're gonna be talking about. So, uh, and I'm just gonna minimize us there. So um, we thought we'd focus on communication generally, conversation, which is so important um, uh, to all of us, and then social connection. Okay, so let's move the slide on. Uh, so I'm going to go through a couple of the um, different types of acquired communication disability after a stroke, some of the challenges and changes to conversation and, and what helps, and again Basha will um, give us her perspective on that, and then a bit of detail about some research that Basha and I and um, um, Jerry from uh, Jerry Johnson from Different Strokes was also involved in. Um, and then we'll move on to your questions. So probably the two main communication difficulties that people experience after a stroke are aphasia, uh, which is a language problem. About a third of people who have a stroke will experience aphasia. And then another common problem is this thing called dysarthria, which rather than a language problem is, is a problem more with the slurring of speech. Other things that are kind of uh, maybe less common but may also co-occur are apraxia, which is um, a motor speech programming um, difficulty. So it's, it, it's where people have problems sequencing the sounds, um, kind of getting them in, in order. And then that some people also find after a stroke, the, the quality of their voice is affected. So it might be, the voice might become quite quiet or a little bit strained and, and harsh. So those are kind of some of the um, uh, types of communication disability that might occur after a stroke. 
I want to talk really briefly about how communication works um, to help us get a bit of a grip around what, what's going on. So as a speech and language therapist, when I'm assessing a person, I, I want to know, are they able to get the, the message in? Are they able to hear and understand things, get the message in? And are they able to think about what they want to say and get the message out? So it's a very sort of uh, an oversimplified model, really, but it helps it helps us think sometimes what's going on um, in relation to um, communication difficulty. So just to expand on that a little bit, on the left hand side of the screen here, we've got um, uh, whoops, sorry about that. Whoops, we've got um, spoken words. So uh, one way of getting the message in is you hear a word, you listen to it, because you've, you've got to attend to it, you've got to sort of pay attention. And then once you've um, heard that word, you've, you've attended to it, you've got to then sort of get into your, um, your lexicon, your system of word meanings and think, right, I've heard that word before. That word, let's say dog, that means it's a four-legged, furry animal that goes that barks okay so you you've gone from hearing it to attending it to making sense in in your brain of what it means so that's one way of getting the message in another way of getting the message in is by reading so you can see text or see see words um, providing your sight is okay uh, read that, think, yeah, uh, that word and sentence means this sort of thing, and then you start thinking about it. So the reason it's quite important to think about these different ways of getting the message in is that sometimes people might find that there's a real problem with getting a spoken word message in, but actually, if they see that word, or if they hear it and see it at the same time, it gets in more, more easily. So that's why we're looking at you know, what routes into getting that message in are functioning well or what, what might be impaired. So now I've got to think about also getting the message out. So if I want to say something in my brain, I will think about uh, what I want to say. So I'm thinking what a miserable day it is today. It's pouring with rain. So I'm gonna have a conversation about the weather. So if I think about that, I need to select and retrieve words that maybe have to do with the weather, like rain, like miserable, like pouring down. So I, I need to sort of um, think that and then retrieve some of those words. When I've retrieved them, I need to shape the sounds that form each of those words. So rain, rain, rain and then I say it, I speak it. So it comes out of my mouth. So that's one way of getting the message out. And similarly, another way of getting the message out might be to, I could write a letter or an email to a friend saying, oh my goodness, what a terrible um, day it is today. And I would be um, again, retrieving the words. I'd then be um, putting them, um, thinking about the spelling, the, the letters that make up those words and writing them. So that's a way of getting a uh, message out by sort of written form. Um, gesturing and drawing are other ways of getting the message out. So again, the, the reason I'm sort of um, thinking about these different ways of getting the message in and getting the message out is if I'm assessing someone, I want to know what can they do, what, what's relatively preserved and what might be um, more or less damaged. So it's a kind of um, helpful way of thinking about language. Okay, so if we think about um, someone who has dysarthria, this um, slurred speech, in terms of getting the message in, well, that's gonna be okay. They, they, if they just have dysarthria, there'll be no problem, they'll hear it. Um, they'll think, yeah, I know what that means. But when it comes to getting the message out, if their um, muscles and of the tongue and lips and articulators are, are 
um, not functioning because they're a bit paralyzed or because they're moving more slowly, that's where the problem will be. So, so we call that a kind of speech problem. In terms of aphasia, if someone might have a, which is a, aphasia being a language problem, people might have a difficulty getting the message in. They might have a problem getting the message in by spoken word or by written word or both. In terms of finding words and getting the message out, they may have a problem with um, speaking a word, finding the word and saying it, or they might have a problem with writing it. So with people with aphasia, you'll often find they'll say things like, oh, I know it in my head, I know what I want to say, but I just can't get the word out. So it's really a problem uh, with uh, finding those words and getting the, the, the language out. And people with, um, uh, um, you may hear people talk about receptive aphasia, which is a problem with getting the, particularly getting the message in and understanding or expressive aphasia, getting the message out. Okay, so just to, to recap, I'm going to focus a bit more on aphasia because it's a little bit more complex, um, it, it being a language problem. So aphasia may affect, affect your talking, your, your ability to find words, to construct sentences, to put those words in, in writing. It may also affect your ability to get the message in, in terms of understanding other people, in terms of monitoring what you say and kind of um, recognizing that any mistakes that you may make. Uh, it may affect your reading. And very commonly people say it affects their ability to use numbers, either to understand them or to um, say numbers or use money or say the time, those kind of things. But uh, aphasia also affects these kind of things. And I'm sure those of you who are living with any kind of communication disability may have had impacts on your, your confidence, the way you're feeling. Um, very often people with aphasia feel quite um, low and it's a much higher incidence of depression after um, aphasia. Um, uh, it also affects how people feel about themselves, their identity. So uh, for example, if working becomes difficult or kind of um, doing things that you used to do after your stroke becomes difficult, identity may be affected and also uh, relationships. A few other issues that can impact on communication. Um, people will often talk about memory as an issue. Now, quite often it's a memory for words, which kind of links in with that aphasia because words are very important. When, when I try and remember something, I will repeat it over and over to myself or I'll write it down. So I use words to support my memory. If you have a problem with words, words going in or retrieving words, that can also feel like a problem with um, memory, remembering names, um, remembering numbers. Some people find that after a stroke, um, they're uh, emotionally labile and may uh, laugh or cry much more easily than they did previously. And obviously, if you're having a conversation and you suddenly kind of become very tearful or you start crying a lot, that can impact on that um, two-way conversation that you're having, particularly with you know people who who uh, kind of love you and bec become upset that you're crying. Or some people find that they um, uh, it happens in the opposite that the slightest humorous thing and they laugh rather you know um, much more than they intend to. People are often very confused when people who have a stroke use much more swearing than previously. And sometimes people may have very sparse um, speech, but um, swear words come out uh, rather readily, um, which can be uh, challenging for everyone. Similarly, some people um, sing, um, can, can find that singing is preserved or automatic speech like, um, yes, please, sorry, shit, those kind of words would just kind of come out, apologies for the um, um, blasphemy there, uh, but just kind of pop out be, uh, sort of automatically, it's actually called automatic speech. And things like fatigue or good days, bad days can have a really big impact on, you know, one day people can remember stuff and the next day uh, it, it, it's much harder to retrieve words or have conversations. So all of these things give a pattern of variability and 
everyone is different, but on the day-to-day -day basis, things can be different as well. So it can be um, quite challenging and quite confusing. Okay, so that's a quick run through things that can happen communication wise. Um, what we're gonna focus on for a bit now is, well, what makes a good conversation? Conversation is so important to who we are and how we feel about things. So, so for me, for example, a good conversation would be something that's, that's two way. You've, uh, I might say something and then I might listen to what uh, my friend's saying and then they might say something, I'll listen to that. So you have this sort of back and forth, this kind of listening, talking, kind of ping pong kind of um, flow. So there's a bit of flow. Usually with a, a good conversation for me, it's, it'd be something we're both interested in. We both have something to say um, about the topic. I mean, obviously lots of conversations at the moment about the blooming coronavirus and what it means for us and what it means for meeting up with friends and going out, et cetera. Um, but so there's a there's this two way flow interest that um, is hopefully enjoyable. So that's what makes good conversation. Well, what about some of the challenges then when one of you in the conversation has a communication disability or has aphasia? Um, these are some of the things that people co would commonly say, um, get in the way of conversations or conversation challenges. So people might say, I, I know what I want to say, I know it in my head, but I just can't get the words out. Or everyone's in a hurry. I need time to have my say. Um, other people will often talk about losing their confidence when speaking is difficult. So sometimes it's easier to just opt out. So if, if you think of all of these things can interrupt that flow and that pleasure and that um, feeling of to and fro in conversation it, and it can become quite one-sided rather than I would say a good conversation it's balanced and two-way then of course you've got the problem about what other people do so um, commonly friends and family members maybe don't quite understand what aphasia is like or what communication disability is like and common problems are um, people will, uh, who've had a stroke will say, you know, they talk too fast. I can't get a word in edgeways. Um, or some people find it uh, frustrating, to say the least, when, um, so when I get stuck, they finish my words for me. And they don't always get it right. They might finish it with a different um, word or sentence, which can be really frustrating. And then, um, some people find that um, because other people don't understand aphasia or don't know what to do, sometimes other people just ignore me or treat me like I'm stupid. So that common problem that um, any kind of communication disability gets equated with somehow being stupid, which is absolutely not the case. OK, so those are some of the challenges. Well, what what are some of the things that people can do then? What, what helps? Well, um, I know Bash is going to talk uh, later about peer support and how brilliant um, learning from other people with aphasia and communication disability, talking to them, spending time with them, being with them, finding out what helps them. Information and resources. There's great information and resources on the Different Strokes website and lots of other uh, websites that um, have, have resources that are good for you, but really are really helpful for your friends and family who perhaps don't know what to do and are embarrassed or withdraw from conversation because they're just not quite sure uh, whether they're getting it right. So obviously you can ask your speech and language therapist if you're still seeing one, or I've got a list of resources at the end and I'm sure you'll have other ones to add to that. Time, uh, giving more time. More time helps people process languages and words, uh, gives people time to think and time to participate. So time is a simple one, but really important. And another thing that can be helpful are what we call conversation props and ramps. So by a, by a conversation ramp, I mean, if you think about um, if someone's a wheelchair user, a, a ramp helps them get into a building. Well, we think about what are the conversation ramps that help you get into a conversation. So that might be things like, maps and calendars and photos, pen and paper, so that you have different ways of helping. If you 
think about this. Some people have difficulty uh, with with yes, you know, just saying yes or no uh, after a stroke. But if they have a way of pointing to it rather than just relying on saying it, then you've got a, a prop, a ramp to help you um, engage in conversations. Okay, so oh, here's just a few examples of um, the, the Aphasia Institute in Canada has some great resources, and you can get some of these access to some of these little pictograms, which can help support a conversation. And here's some others that um, uh, pictures that can help support a conversation about the dreaded uh, virus. But you can see they they're just then they're just a, a tool to help um, engage when uh, finding those words or saying those words or writing those words can be challenging. <coughs> Just top tips there. Um, so use pen and paper, one thing at a time, don't pretend you understand, try and slow down, don't rush, give yourself time to have that conversation. Using drawings and pictures, keywords, um, so, you know, just a word here or there can back up that getting the message in or, or help with getting the message out. Try and be as relaxed and natural as possible. Um, recapping and checking that you've both understood before you kind of get down the conversation and realize you're both in different ballparks and not quite uh, in the same field. A really important, ask the person with aphasia what helps. And if you're a person living with aphasia, have prepared some tools, what helps, and keeping background noise down. So those are just some, some top tips there. Okay, finally, the third part of the, this uh, uh, talk is just thinking about the importance of social connection. And there's, there's tons of evidence now on the importance of staying in touch with people, staying in touch with friends uh, and family members, particularly difficult during these coronavirus times but there's there's research now that says having friends and staying in touch with your friends is as important for your health as giving up smoking or or, or not being obese so so friends and friendship really really important and um i would recommend i know satinda has done a, a lovely talk on the different strokes page looking at um, the importance of social connection for well-being some of the changes in friendship and relationships that uh, people tend to talk about. Um, my friends don't know what to do, so some of them have stopped contacting me. This isn't always the case, I should say, but um, th sometimes this happens. Um, friends and family, they don't always understand about my stroke and my communication. My family um, tend to worry about me all the time, and sometimes people talk about uh, family, sometimes being a little bit overprotective, wrapping you up in cotton wool, which can make it challenging. And obviously being hard to stay in touch with friends during the virus. So here's, uh, ba here's Basha and here's myself. Here's lovely Jerry Johnson um, and some other people with aphasia. And we decided to do some research into friendship because there's very little about it in the research um, world. Uh, so we talked about, our, our study asked uh, what happens when you have a stroke and you also have a communication disability. What do people uh, with aphasia think is, is important? What can people do to maintain friendships or make new friends? Um, and what can other people like friends, family and health professionals do, do to help? So in terms of what did some of the people we, we spoke with in the research say about their friendships? Well, a, a common thing was that it's hard, it's hard work. You know, it's really hard work. Friendship at the best of times, you, you've got to work at it. Uh, one lady said, um, and a number of people talked about difficulties with um, feeling themselves and feeling who they were after their stroke. And this lady said in the first three years, I wasn't anybody to be with. She felt she's kind of lost herself. And because I didn't know myself, I wasn't a friend to anybody. So she found it hard to um, be in that kind of reciprocal relationship. 
Here's someone else. They said, families are great. Families are lovely, but sometimes they smother you. Sometimes they can be um, overprotective. And that's kind of tended to push my friends to the side. And then different sources of friendship. And one thing that came out very highly was the importance of animals of friends. Um, and this person said that they're non-judgmental and they're totally reliant on you for their well-being. So it's an area where you could sort of continue to have that sort of equal relationship. It, the, the big headlines, the summary from our research was that, kind of quite obvious, but good to restate, friends and friendship are really, really, really important. They're important for your health and well-being. Friends can be really helpful in your recovery from um, stroke and from communication disability. And friends and friendships are really important for the family members of people who've had a stroke too. It's really important that they uh, stay connected with their, their friends. Um, friends can be invisible and neglected in the medical drama of stroke. So there, there's such a lot going on at the beginning that um, sometimes friends can be a bit neglected. So it's important that they hang in there and stay part of the recovery process. And then finally, that friendship is, is complex. Uh, it's, it's quite a complex relationship and it's, it's got the capacity to change and it's always changing for all of us. Um, but maybe particularly when something um, big like uh, a stroke comes along in your life. Now, he, he, th these were some of the findings um, from our study. We talked to, oh, about uh, ooh, 30, 50 people with um, uh, a phase, a stroke and a phase. And these were some of the key themes that came up. So one was that uh, friends are so important because they can act as an anchoring. Um, so loyal friends who, are, who stick with you through thick and thin and people who, friends who believe in you and friends you can trust, they can be really helpful in making you, helping you sort of find yourself uh, after you've been lost. And this, um, the last bullet point there, fast friends with aphasia. That those are people, fast friends were people that um, uh, folks met at peer support groups and they could be really, really helpful in terms of recovery. Time, we've said before, is really important. Give it time, give it time to recover. Um, friendship is a good um, friendship can go beyond words. It doesn't have to be all about talking. So find creative ways of communicating and find ways that um, maybe don't involve so much speech, but are just about hanging out together. So, um, you know, going for a walk with a pet, having a laugh together uh, were really important. And other things important like getting out, using technology and um, being flexible. Those were some of the key points. And um, there's more about that on our website if people are interested in that. So briefly, just some tips for staying connected. These are from people with aphasia to others who've had a stroke. Talk to peers with aphasia, find out what's helped them stay in touch and think about some of those um, little steps and things that you can do. One person said that they, they regretted not letting people know early on that they'd had a stroke and their communication was um, difficult now. But, and they advised sort of sending a card, letting people know, and then people got in touch. Um, finding ways to offer something in return, um, this issue of reciprocity, doing something that, that made um, your friendships feel more balanced rather than it being all one-way traffic. Importantly, don't make assumptions about negative reactions. Um, sometimes people felt, oh, oh, my friends, they don't come and visit me anymore. But sometimes it was um, not so much the friends who were withdrawing, it was the person who'd had the stroke themselves who, you know, perhaps through lack of confidence or, you know, the way they were, their mood, um, they were the people who were withdrawing. So, so check out the negative reactions, try and think where they're coming from. Prioritize relationships as well as the good stuff that happens in rehabilitation. Give your friends information about aphasia and um, particularly what helps you, bearing in mind that everyone is different, what do you find different, difficult and what can friends do 
that takes some of the pressure off speech and make an effort, um, stay in touch, maybe find some regular times that you can um, zoom in at the moment with uh, friends or, or, or meet up if they're in your bubble, find new ways to hang out together. And finally, very importantly, keep a sense of humor. So those are some tips uh, and ideas that came out of the research. And as I say, there's more on our website that I've put up in the resources. Okay, so now bring in Basha, we're gonna um, answer some of the questions that come up quite frequently. So I'm just gonna go through the questions, then Basha's gonna come in and um, let's put her up here and uh, talk us through some of her thoughts. What types of therapy help? Confidence is often a big thing. How can I improve it when you have, when communication is challenging? Here's a big billion dollar question. Will my speech ever get better? Looking forward to the answer to that one, Basha. Um, are there any apps or computer programs or technology that can help? And what about um, uh, keeping with the theme of friendship, any advice on keeping friendships going? So those are the questions we're gonna have a go at answering. I'm gonna stop sharing my screen now so that you can see Basha. Ta-da, you're back, Basha. So, right. if we start with um, what types of therapy did you have and what types of things helped? Well, therapy is so big. The the so basically for me it was one to one first for therapists and me one to one al alone without anybody other people there, <clears throat> and that's why I I found out that I got aphasia. I didn't know what was called even, and I didn't see any people any people with my 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 R my aphasia so I thought I'm very alone there's nobody people like me at all I thought and um, and so basically my therapy um, get in touch with other other organization and universities to to help me to just well first to see other people with aphasia which is good so I went to connect thank god and then um, um, I see that people like me and um, it's really fantastic to see they're all different, everybody different, aphasia, different type of aphasia. So I'm, some people can write, some people can't like me. Even now, I can't write. Um, but luckily, there's lots of technology to help. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> And I can read. Some people never read or can't read, and some people read really quickly. And so basically, so first one-to-one -one therapy, then peer support. So sometimes you have a group meeting with a facilitator, like therapy, um, language therapies, and then there's more more groups with like focus group or conversation about this and that. And then slowly I got into the research, different research, and you see what kind of aphasia I have, because obviously you see you see, then you can see everybody different. That's that's the one thing I found out that it's just everybody different. But the best thing of the whole world is peer support. You see people like you. That's that's the um, that's yeah. That's so. Basic. So is it that seeing other people like you or who are a bit different in this way or that way sort of helps you understand your own communication? Difficulty. Yes, definitely. Yeah, yeah. And obviously, slowly, I was, I was therapy for other people. Yeah. Like, after stroke. And you see people like me with before, and you yeah. see, oh, I can help them. Yeah. And, and for me, I, 
for me, it's really good to have one or two other people together, not just one to one, even peer support, one to one. Yeah. It's not it's not fantastic unless you really know well, unless when when you are friends slowly, you can talk one to one. So it's interesting. Sorry, it's yeah. interesting that um, you know when you're talk when we're talking about what therapy helps. It's not just um, speech and language therapy. It's peer support. It's getting involved with research. It's perhaps volunteering at a support group. Yes, uh, all yeah. all of the all of those things can be you know therapeutic. Exactly. I mean, I mean, you talk about this this friends like fast friends. When, when you're aphasia and you talk only a few question, a few, um, a few sentences, the only thing you say new people is not small chat, no at all. You said straight away, you say uh, uh, to, to talk how many months or years you have stroke. Mm -hmm. And you speak and you root so that, it's, it's you share it's that really experience so you instantly have a kind of connection straight away and it's good yeah, great it's, it's fantastic because you don't have to chit chat for you know your friends you or small talk. yeah yeah great yeah okay thanks thanks basha let's go to the second question which was around confidence um I mean, did you did did your confidence take a take a bash, and how how did you cope with that? For me, confidence, like um, what's it called um, like literal meaning of confidence. People's, I I haven't I didn't. For me, confident me is in identity. Okay. Not like like. I always, even straight away, I go out. I don't care what people think me. You know, I go out on the bus to go to university to whatever. So I'm not confident. I am not I'm confident going out. Mm -hmm. Obviously, speak. I have to only. I didn't say a few. Only a few words. So I say I put my my mouth on my. Say sorry. You know, like that. So. Mm -hmm. I'm not confident, I want confident for that, but <clears throat> my 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 family and new people, um, I was identity because because I can't speak. I thought, well, I'm I'm useless, you know, not intellectual, but I'm useless because I can't communicate. Mm -hmm. And that was that was that's I did sort of cry, and I people, um, and then I laugh because it's weird, and you know. And, and so, what, what 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 helped you um, through your confidence? So part was it partly around getting your sort of sense of identity back? Yes, yes, and and basically my friends helped me, and peer support helped me because. I thought, oh, I can help other people. Mm -hmm. And that's really important. I mean, that for me, that's why I do volunteer for everything because I want to help other people. Yeah. And that's my confidence, I suppose, yeah. and my identity. I can, my my job gone, my parents, my my children don't speak to me because I can't talk properly. So I got new identity. And I like that. Yeah, great. Um, so, and any thoughts on? I know when you're um, working in your peer support um, sessions, I'm sure people say to you, "Will my speech ever get better? Yeah. Will yeah. Will I? Will my speech improve? Will I get better? What What do you? How do you respond well, to that one? I mean, Tricky I one. always say everybody different, and it's true. It's <laughs> true. But obviously, I notice my 20 years experience that some people don't speak and then later they do speak you know and it is all it's it's in the brain the brain is so i mean i love the brain that's why i really really sort of um 
I read really quickly after my stroke, thank God. And I read and read about my brain, other, other brain or whatever. <clears throat> and they are lots of research now for the brain. So maybe things before you think never again, back to they do. <clears throat> and and things like like for example, after my stroke, I can't speak Polish. I'm a Polish person. <clears throat> English come quick quite quickly. Well, 20 years I speak now is not bad, but it's not fantastic. But my but Polish, I can't speak even now. I can't speak, but I can understand everything. But I can't speak. So maybe my brain, I know is there. Because if I can understand, that means it's there. Mm. But you have to, maybe I need therapy, Polish therapy, or maybe go to Poland for three months. And then it's like absorb, absorb, maybe. Who knows? Well, that's a bit like it's, we were talking about. It, it's there. You know you, you know what you want to say, but it's just getting the words in Polish. It's yeah. the message out. For, um, for and, yeah, and in in... Polish is like before English is you can see exactly but you can't mm. in Polish more complicated mm. I mean sometimes sometimes I know one word with start with a or something or s mm. but after that nothing but mm. if you have you know whatever yeah mm. I think sorry yeah that's all right. No, you, um, you I was going to say, um, we were speaking the other day and I said to you, do you think your speech is still, uh, your language is still improving after 20 years? And you said. Yes, definitely. <laughs> yeah. Definitely, yeah. Yeah, because I mean, some people don't speak, don't see me or talk me about, you know, a few months and they say, oh, you're, you know, obviously, I'm supposed to be um, recording here, and you know, it's I'm not I'm not um, um, bothered, but it's different to one to one person, uh, friends to talk. So obviously, I I speak better with my friends one to one and just relax. You know, yeah. I mean, yeah. I'm not it's restrained. It's better than others. Yeah, it's yeah. more formal. It's, this yeah. this is formal, really. But I, I suppose the key, the message, um, I think, is interesting. People often say you, know, you make the most improvement in the first few months after a stroke, but I I know you, and I know a lot of other people who, five, ten, and twenty years after, as are saying that they are they feel they're still improving which is i think is an important message yes. so it may not be that speech comes back to how it was before but there are different ways of um feeling feeling better and, and recovering okay yes. uh, then on to the next question um basha um which was are there any apps or computer programs or technology that you find helpful or that friends yes <coughs> Well, before mm -hmm. you know, under my, my stroke, there's nothing available except except email, <clears throat> and obviously email. Ugh. But straight away, I got um, with a with a university. I got Dragon Speak to my computer, so then I can talk, mm -hmm. and then computer says blah blah blah, and then I can because I can read. I can I can look what is there not quite right and blah so they take ages basically <clears throat> and then obviously slowly message from a phone is is messages oh. that helps because you speak to your phone as well yeah and you can yeah yeah and there are, there and are some apps then that... apps, mm -hmm. facebook okay facebook, facebook. yeah but other ones <clears throat> But for me, I'm not good technology, really. So I don't do anything like apps like to help me, my therapy. No, I yeah. didn't do that. But Facebook and friends is good. Yeah. So, I mean, just to put <coughs> up from some other, other people I've 
talk to who use different apps. So they might use uh, an app that, um, if reading is difficult, that translates text to speech. Um, yes, yes, and yes. And also, um, there are there's more evidence now that uh, there are some software programs that can help people practice word finding, for example. And there's evidence that that can be really quite helpful in terms yes. of improving um, speech and language. And I've put some links on um, the, the final slide, which I'll show in a minute. OK, and then just um, lastly, just um, focusing on um, advice on keeping friendships, um, Basha, any yes. uh, tips and advice there? Well, when, when, we, when I was hospital first time, you know, luckily I, I have lots of colleagues from work and friends, you know, um, come to see me and I notice straight away they come two or three together mm -hmm. and it's really fantastic because I can't speak that time I can speak at all <clears throat> but I I hear I they talk all together with me as well but I don't talk and they you know and it's really um like amuse yourself themselves and funny things and they say what they do whatever you know what happened work whatever <clears throat> and it, it's fantastic because if I have one person a colleague one to one it's going to be really horrible mm -hmm. he's sitting there yeah. said one or two things and I can answer only yes or no so if they have banter like between them and you could kind of join yeah. in rather than it exactly exactly you, I to say, ha, 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 you know yeah. And yeah, uh, and obviously I have always even in the hospital. I have luckily I have <clears throat> my bag from work because it happened when I go to work. So I have pa uh, pads and diaries and pen, so I can, you know, when I want to say something, and I can draw <laughs> very bad drawing because my hand right hands was useless, so I have to write the other hand. And it's not good. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Even now, when I want to, uh, no, that time I want to my 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 husband. What, what I want to eat, and I want to write pizza. Even I can't do pizza. Mm -hmm. My that hands in the hospital. Yeah, I thought they they at last they do it. They do it. So got pizza. <laughs> Thank God. <laughs> But um, so fr friends, and then after hospital, uh, I mean, if you can or family can to advise people, we have just a stroke, tell them to your friend to go two together or three together or go to like shopping. Like um, I have four friends go me in the shop together and it's very good because you can you can look things not just talk mm -hmm. and you know, <clears throat> and then a little bar off to have a drink or something like that <clears throat> it's better to have for the first time it's better to have only one not one person but two or something yeah and that's good that's good i mean i was lucky because my friends i think know that i know not for me good but for them good actually yes. because so it helped was, them it helped them to yeah. be more relaxed yeah. having each other there as well as you yes yeah, yeah. And obviously they invite for dinner with my husband and few people together and that's nice yeah i mean if you now if virus is not as good obviously i don't know i mean obviously i think my speech worse as well because I don't want to zoom all the time, mm -hmm. and, you know. And yeah. uh, have, um, just, have you been involved in any in any groups on Zoom um, during the? Um, only like like meeting for for the um, charities called Aphasia Reconnect. Right, like or, trustee meetings or group meetings yeah, or planning. Yeah. Meetings. yeah, 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 yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah. I don't go to go to like conversation group or yeah. what's. 
I know, um, I do know some um, groups that are, are, are still meeting virtually and that that's, that's sort of working quite, quite well. Yeah. It's another yes. way of um, staying in touch with friends, I guess. Um, but uh, Well, they yeah. do. I think it's good because the groups are like, like um, more formal groups, like music group. They sit, listen and, and vote, you know, what's yeah. better. Yeah. It is. Or, or conversation group where you have themes of yeah. things. So if you have a theme and you're all focused on that or you know what you're talking yeah. about, or sometimes that's sort of sharing a screen where you've got some written things or pictures to uh, focus yeah. on on uh, yeah. the internet can support conversation, I think, with friends. Um, yeah. Okay, Basha, I'm just a bit aware of the time. So I think we need anything else burning you wanted to say on any of those questions? Um, mm. Mm. Well, just f talking about friends and identity, basically, like, if you have stroke first time, like, the family look after you, whatever, but you need friends because they know they know more than the family what's what you what are no what your inside like what ticks you what yeah what makes um, you tick yeah yeah mm, it's yeah. completely different family yeah they have a different kind of perspective and maybe um i mean family members or partners can know you very well also but sometimes friends have a different perspective in yeah knowing you in a different way that can uh bring exactly to the party. because yeah yeah because before i was a mother and i work and work is really important and family important and i have friends as well but mm. it's not primarily the mm. friends but after your stroke and i can't work i didn't work at all after that um and the family's always there and they criticize you a lot as well and you can't under you can't what's called back whatever they, they say you can't make well no you're you're this and that you can't but mm -hmm. your friends are there and so my identity was the family and the work but now i haven't got that well i haven't family but the friends after my stroke and fast friend and new friends and you know loyal friends it comes like you are identity is back identity back so yeah. that's important i think great yeah. thanks thanks for that basha i'm gonna stop now but just before we go i'm gonna share my screen again so that <clears throat> we can just show some of the um some resources that we um put up there um places where you can get more information um the aphasia software finder if you're interested in apps um and and software to help uh that's our website on friendship um and oh there's some great youtube videos by um sarah scott talking about her experiences of aphasia and the stroke association for example has a guide to communication problems after stroke so those are some uh, resources. So thank you to anyone who's uh, watching or listening. And uh, that's it. I think we're going to say goodbye now. So bye. For goodbye. Me. Bye. And bye. get in touch if you have any other questions. Uh, 